good morning or hello. It's, it's, hello. Not, it's not morning anymore. Uh, we're going to do this in English because your German is non existent, right? Uh, I too. Ich, ich verstehe ein morning. bisschen und spreche ein bisschen Deutsch, aber oh. ich glaube, es besser. Better we have us in English. But it, like, if some people are like too shy to ask in English, can they ask you something in German and you reply in English? We we'll can try. Maybe you'll help translate if yes. they don't get it. Yes, yes. Um, we're gonna do this just like just like to, uh, yesterday with uh, Jens Weidmann. I'm just gonna ask him some question at the start. You break the ice, and then it's your turn. You can ask whatever you want in terms of monetary policy. Economy, economy, economic stuff, is that all right? Is there anything you don't want to answer? No, it's all, it's all all right. Of course, it is special because normally I know if I'm coming to speak about something that what's, what I'm going to speak about, but uh, uh, this is special because I really don't know what you're going to ask. This but, is a uh, town hall. I will, uh, I will try to answer whatever questions you have. Don't you do this in, in Estonia? Like for... Uh, I, well, dem well I, have, I have been going, uh, speaking to students, for example, I'm going to a high school uh, now on Monday. We'll have a debate, uh, but then uh, normally I make a, make a short, short introduction about something and then there are questions, but, uh, but never quite, I actually haven't uh, ever had a meeting exactly like that, so it's exciting. All right, so uh, let's start off like, uh, since when does Estonia have the Euro? Estonia has the Euro since 2011. Uh, we had, before that, we had the Estonian Kroon, which was our currency since 1992. Uh, Estonia regained independence in, uh, in 91. Uh, and uh, just, just to say a few words about the currency, then we had uh, the Estonian Kroon, which was actually tied to uh, uh, Deutsche uh, Mark. So we had uh, uh, always the, the exchange rate was that one uh, German Mark was eight Kroons. Uh, and then we've, we kept that um, fixed also uh, when Euro was introduced in, um, in Germany. And then finally in 2011, then we adopted Euro ourselves. Any regrets uh, in getting the Euro? Because there are a lot of uh, Euro countries nowadays who were like, ah, maybe we shouldn't have done that. No, actually in our case, I think it was very natural because uh, as I said, we had, uh, we had the exchange rate fixed anyways. So I think some countries that, uh, uh, that are a bit hesitant whether they should, uh, should have the euro or not also in the European Union, uh, in their case, they might think that they benefit from the fluctuations from the exchange rate and that gives, gives them some flexibility in their economies. In our case, uh, well, the exchange rate was fixed anyways. Uh, plus we had the problems that uh, not everyone believed that we were ab able to maintain this uh, fixed rate. So perhaps some uh, investors who were putting their money in Estonia, they were concerned. They didn't know if this one to eight, uh, for example, the, uh, uh, the exchange rate will, uh, will be there forever. And also, uh, for example, Estonian companies, when they were exporting, importing, they always had the, uh, uh, exchange, uh, the cost of converting currency. If you were traveling as a person, you had to worry about different currencies. So uh, I think in the case of Estonia, it was very natural and it was in my view, it was all positive to, uh, to actually get the euro also in our country. So, I mean, in Germany, there are 82 million people. Uh, I think in Estonia, it's like around 1.5 million, like a Frankfurt Metroplex. Yes, we have fewer people than in Germany. It's, um, yeah, yeah. One, it's actually 1.3 now, I think, 1. is the latest 3. count. 1.3. <laughs> yeah. I mean, most people know what, uh, how we make money, like uh, with our industries, and uh, we're famous for the car industries. What does Estonia do to make money? What's, what is your economy based on? It is actually it is quite uh, diversified. So we have different, uh, different industries, manufacturing, uh, some uh, some technology, also manufacturing uh, uh, business. Uh, we have uh, well in Germany, I think you have a lot of forest. We have a lot of forest uh, forest in Estonia. So there's a forestry uh, industry. We, in the last few few years, a very successful uh, line of business has been, for example, making uh, wooden houses and exporting them to uh, Scandinavia or different sort of uh, products. We just don't want to export plain wood anymore, but uh, so get more value out of it, out of it. And increasingly you have uh, more and more services also. So you have uh, 
uh, also the IT sector is growing very fast. Uh, you have many, uh, uh, many I, uh, IT companies that provide services not only to Estonian other firms, but also internationally and are just based in Estonia. What's the most successful industry in Estonia? Well, there are success stories, I think, in, uh, in many industries, but speaking of these more modern uh, technology-based uh, based companies, we have a few success stories in the, in the IT uh, area. So, for example, uh, I don't know if you use, uh, th this is an example that Estonians like to, uh, like to bring when you use Skype the, uh, uh, for internet calls, then this was actually programmed and headquartered in Estonia. It was actually, I think it were Swedish investors mostly behind it, but uh, at least some Estonians became wealthy and they started new companies also. We have now, um, as we're talking about money, then there is, uh, uh, I think they're offering also services in, uh, in Germany, is TransferWise. Uh, so this is an Estonian company actually. They're now, I think they're, they're legally now established in the UK, but it's really two Estonian guys who set it up and most of the staff is still in, uh, in Tallinn. So we have, uh, we have these uh, different kinds of new things popping up in Estonia as well. So you're the youngest ECB board member. Um, like we met, I am, we, we yes. had Jens yesterday, he's a little older than you, but you're 42, right? I'm 42, I actually, uh, yes, I'm now the youngest. I'm, yeah, the I youngest. don't know if I have, if do, do, do you have. Do you have younger ideas than the rest? Do you have, do you have a different vision? Well, I'm younger, so I don't know, maybe, <laughs> maybe there is some difference. But, uh, did, did I actually you, asked, I thought that Jens Weidmann was also 42 when, when he became the president of Bundesbank. I actually asked him, he said, no, I think I was 43. So I, uh, maybe, I, I don't know if there has been anyone younger, but um, for now, right now, in the current ECB governing council, I, I am the youngest, yeah. But, uh, did you have different ideas than the older white men on your board? Because we, we, we only wise, know wise, the, wise men, the yes. ECB president is a woman, yes. the rest is old men, <laughs> yeah. and you. Do you have different ideas than the well, old men? I, I don't think there's a line that I'm young and everyone else is old. <laughs> I think Jens Weidmann is quite young still. There are a few uh, other um, uh, youngish uh, governors, but uh, uh, no, I'm not sure if the age really makes a difference in monetary policy. <laughs> But did you, did you, what, what, what is your politics when it comes to monetary policy? Are you um, in favor of uh, the quantitative easing of Mr. Draghi in the last few years? Were you a fan of it? Jens is, was not a fan? I know that uh, we also have uh, Bloomberg and Reuters journalists sitting in the back, so I, I'm still kind of careful. <laughs> but. Uh, uh, you can be but, honest, you can be honest. Yes, yes. yes. so basically, uh, I think it, well, there was this uh, uh, very much uh, published uh, discussion on monetary policy in September at the ECB uh, governing council and there were different views that were also sort of brought public. Uh, I think really there, there was no, uh, no question given the uh, economic outlook for, for the euro area and how low the inflation is, how much it is below the target for the ECB that uh, we really need to have what we call an accommodative monetary policy. So you need to have uh, low interest rates. Uh, so the question is really just how far you should go with it. Uh, there was this debate whether we should go and uh, again start uh, purchasing different uh, uh, securities by the, uh, by the central banks and thereby sort of providing, uh, providing more, um, uh, more liquidity, more money to the economy and thereby uh, uh, trying to uh, uh, sort of push up the economy and the inflation even further. Uh, well, it's no, so, uh, you, you want an answer. So I, uh, uh, I was not uh, very much in favor of the idea of re uh, starting again with the uh, asset purchases. But, uh, of course, there were different parts of the, uh, different pieces of the package. I wasn't really against, uh, against everything, so I think it makes sense for example, in, in, uh, in the current situation, to have these very, very low interest rates, and I was in favor of that decision. But why were you against certain parts of it? Because, like, the Americans do it, the Japanese do it, like the quantitative easing part, Europeans have to do it as well. Well, we have been doing it. It's yeah. just a question of... Uh, so why, why, do, why did you want to stop? Yeah, so the question is if you... Basically, we had stopped already. 
the question is if we will, uh, if it is the right time uh, uh, to restart this program again. I guess the pros and cons, of course, uh, are there that you, first of all, indeed, the inflation is low, you should do what you can as a central bank. But on the other hand, given how much of this, what we call the unconventional uh, policy steps have, have we taken already, uh, you have to be also uh, aware of different side effects and, and maybe think twice before you do something. So when it comes to um, when it comes to these asset purchases, well, the questions, the skeptical questions were around basically, if uh, given how long, how um, low the interest rates are already, if you look at, for example, the uh, uh, German government bonds, at that point they have. Meanwhile, the interest rates have come up a little bit, but uh, at the point of that decision in uh, in September, I think also 30-year. Uh, government bonds from Germany were uh, basically trading at the negative interest rates. So, so the government of Germany is being paid for uh, uh, for borrowing money, which really, in traditional economic sense, doesn't make much sense. So, if we, we as a central bank go and start buying even more of those securities, you sort of push the uh, push the returns even lower, and then you just ask that that's that how much does it make sense, or if there's any any real further benefit of that. So it's really a balance between uh, benefits and the risks that you see, and different, different people may see it differently. Were, were some of your concerns um, wrong that you had last years when it, comes to, when it comes to quantitative easing? Like some of your, oh my god, maybe the, we get hyperinflation or something? Um, no, there's no, there's no risk of hyperinflation now, but... Right. Uh, but I mean, you, you mentioned inflation. The inflation target is around two percent in the yes, eurozone. It's uh, close, but below two. Yes, we, 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 right now we have <laughs> we have 0.7 percent. We need to do something no, in it's Estonia. Much, it's, it's below 1.7. Yeah, yeah. Oh, uh, 0 0.7. Yeah. Yes. The eurozone. Yes. In Estonia, it's 3.4. So I was like, well, you should tell us how you can rise the, the inflation rate. Yeah, well... Uh, how, do we, how do we do it? How do, how do we get to our target in the Eurozone? Jens, well, in case, in Jens, case, Jens didn't want to tell us. Oh, uh, so maybe I should be careful too. Yes. <laughs> yeah. 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 So, well, you only mentioned instruments, certain yes. instruments. Maybe you want you to hear tell. about the instruments? Yes. Okay, no, uh, speaking of Estonia, you mentioned that um, we have uh, higher inflation. Of course, uh, I very well understand, I think people in, uh, in Estonia, in general, they understand that as uh, the average sort of incomes, the, the average level of wealth in Estonia is lower than the euro area average. I think we're at about two thirds right now uh, for the EU uh, uh, total in terms of GDP per capita. So uh, we are still converging to the, uh, to the uh, higher income. Uh, members of the euro area, and if you do that, you have incomes growing, growing faster, you also have prices inevitably growing faster than the average, so uh, I'm totally fine with inflation in Estonia being above 2%. I think we're actually expecting it to be around 2% in Estonia for the next two years. It's, uh, it's going to be lower in, in the euro area, and, uh, and I think this, this part of it is quite natural. Yep. But, so, but, but your job is to uh, get to the target of 1.92%. No, right now it's 0 0.7. How do we yes. get to your target? Uh, well, this is, this is, of course, something that uh, is behind everything that the uh, ECB has been doing so far. This is why we have interest rates as low as they are. This is uh, basically the... The objective is to get the inflation up. There's a, there's a, it, it, it hasn't been working, obviously. Exactly. Maybe so, you need some new ideas. Yes, so that's the, um, uh, that's the debate, really, that how, how patient you should be. Uh, because I think uh, you really need to have some patience, first of all. <laughs> uh, if you look at the, uh, look at the different, uh, uh, different macro numbers for the euro area, you see, for example, that even if, even if prices have been low, then uh, slowly uh, salaries have been growing, you would expect that as incomes of people grow, uh, if they start buying more stuff, more, more services, so at the end you would also see, uh, see inflation pick up. Uh, but of course it hasn't, this hasn't taken place as quickly as uh, uh, some people would have hoped. So yeah. um, that's, I think that's the, uh, 
Uh, that's the question, really. That how how uh, patient should we be? And there, I think we should be a little bit patient. What what's but yeah? What, what's the answer? Like how long can you s still be patient? And and what's what's the answer? Like and when you still wait and wait and wait and nothing happens, what can you do? When patience is not the answer. Well, I think we. Uh, we need to keep, from the central bank perspective, what we can do is, is only deal with the uh, monetary policy. There are other instruments that the government, for example, uh, can use, and there are other forces beyond the control of the uh, central bank that uh, have an influence on, uh, on price levels. So you have, for example, people buying more and more stuff online uh, from, uh, in our case, you have uh, people buying from, over the internet from China, for example, more and more. Uh, very cheap uh, products, which uh, of course have an imp has an impact on the uh, on the price level, but it's very difficult for the central bank really to do anything about it. So uh, I think we have our tools; we have to use them, and we just do the best we can. And, uh, but you, just, you still didn't tell us what the tools are. You only said patience. Patience. Oh, patience. so basically the tools are the standard tools are of course the uh, uh, the interest rates, since we now have already. Uh, negative interest rates for banks who, being, uh, who uh, uh, bring the deposits to, uh, to the central bank. Uh, there's a question: how much, how much further can you go with the negative interest rates? Uh, I think you may uh, you may face problems at some point that this also loses its effectiveness. And then the other the other main tool or the instrument is this uh, 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 central bank buying of different kinds of assets, mostly government securities, but also. Um, you can buy corporate securities, uh, different institutions issue, issue bonds that the uh, central bank can buy. And then a third important instrument for the central bank recently has been uh, what we call uh, uh, forward guidance. So basically, you influence the, uh, the interest rates not only by, uh, by uh, just saying that for now the interest rate is whatever it is, but you also commit to a future path. So basically you say that uh, interest rates are very low now, and we promise that we will not raise them also until uh, things really change, and you, you indicate that there's a timeline for, like in, in what we have now, basically, we have said that, rest assured, the interest rates, first of all, they're low now, and they also will not be raised in the very near future. And I think that gives sort of a further, further effect. All right, I'm gonna open up to questions. Who wants to start out? Hmm. Let's go with you. Hello, Maris. Uh, I'm Karl. Hello. Um, I'm interested in what are your thoughts about a um, digital European currency? Uh, digital European currency. So, uh, we, of course, if you, if you make uh, payments uh, over the internet, it's effectively it is a digital, uh, digital euro that you're using. But I think you mean like cryptocurrencies and uh, still yeah maybe cryptocurrency maybe with a eu blockchain or something yes. else so i think uh, i think what we're seeing is that uh, uh, that the central banks they have they're becoming more and more aware that uh, uh, as you see private sector companies coming up with new ideas for new uh, payment uh, instruments you had uh, for example the facebook libra uh, project recently starting from Bitcoin a few years ago. Uh, I think we, we've gotten to a point where central banks also understand that you cannot just say that this is, uh, uh, this is too risky and people shouldn't, uh, shouldn't use these uh, new ways of uh, uh, paying or in, uh, investing. And really, we as central banks should also think about how to, uh, uh, how to make sure that the services that we provide are relevant and that uh, uh, and that we effectively we can compete with uh, whatever private private solutions there are. Uh, now, when you look at what the uh, uh, what the European Central Banks are doing, so for example, for payments, we now have the uh, uh, the instant payments uh, uh, platform, basically also in Europe. Uh, I don't know how much it's used already in uh, in Germany, in Estonia, most. Most payments between different bank accounts, for example, if I if I want to 
pay you money and you have an account in a different bank, it will still move in a second. So, uh, uh, so I think that makes it already so convenient with the, uh, with the uh, traditional money that you may ask if I really need uh, uh, some sort of a new crypto alternative. Um, so I think the first, the first thing that the central banks are doing, they want to make the traditional uh, uses of, uh, of money and the traditional forms of payment as convenient as possible that, uh, uh, that you would still stick with the official money. Because I think there are many benefits for the, for the euro compared to a private sector issued uh, whatever currency that you perhaps cannot really trust, trust so well. But then, then you will have questions for, uh, uh, for international payments outside Europe how to make those as convenient as possible. I mentioned the Estonian uh, TransferWise example, who is uh, doing their part to get the, uh, uh, get the uh, costs of uh, currency exchange at least as low as possible. But uh, I think, I think we, so I'm talking too long, but basically I think there, of course there is a, uh, there is a trend towards more and more digital payments. Uh, and, uh, and the central banks have to react to that. Perhaps at some point you will also, you will also see uh, uh, really a digital uh, central bank currency which is different from the current uh, forms of payments. I, th I don't think we're quite there yet, uh, but, uh, but certainly the central banks together with all sorts of private companies are also thinking along the same lines. You have a follow-up? Do you think do you think the central banks are fast enough with this um, situation? Because there are a lot of cryptocurrencies already, and a lot of um, companies with different use cases who are already using some of the cryptocurrencies. Well, when it comes to, uh, for example, retail payments, since we already since I think it was last year when this uh, 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 central bank instant payment system came live, so you could say that we are fast enough when it comes to uh, uh, creating the infrastructure for, uh, for quick payments in Europe. Uh, but uh, I think this is, this is just not enough, so we, uh, I think we need to still work hard to make sure that, uh, uh, that, uh, that we, <laughs> so we manage to bring, manage to provide the payment services, for example, that, uh, uh, that, uh, uh, that remained relevant. But when it comes to all those private, private solutions, of course, you have to be aware that uh, uh, they are inherently different than official currency. And you, uh, you may not have the same kind of trust towards this private company than you have uh, for Bundesbank, for example. Uh, they may have issues with, uh, uh, with the sort of money, how to man uh, manage the money, money laundering or data protection uh, uh, questions. So I think these are all, uh, all issues that uh, Facebook, when they come out, came out with, uh, with the Libra proposal, they perhaps hadn't thought through properly. So now they, they are getting this official pushback where ministries and central banks ask them that, uh, okay, it sounds very interesting what, you, what you're doing, but have you thought about this, that, and the third thing? And they really, I think, haven't yet. So it's not, not moving forward as quick as perhaps the, uh, uh, perhaps the Facebook and the other companies behind it wished, wished for in the beginning. Are you, are you fav in favor of getting rid of cash? Like in Germany, Germans love cash. Um, what about Estonia? Do, does everybody pay mm. with credit card and whatever? When you look at uh, statistics, we pay more using electronic uh, means of payment uh, than you do. Uh, but I would, uh, I would not say that I'd like to get rid of cash. Because we have, from the central bank's perspective, we are we're a little bit split because, first of all, it is, of course, our duty to maintain uh, a good uh, cash circulation in, uh, uh, in the country. But at the same time, we also uh, are trying to promote modern ways of payments and, uh, and make sure that there are effective uh, uh, electronic payments uh, next to cash. We don't want to really say that one is better than the other. I think we, uh, we've seen, for example, in some Scandinavian countries that have gone very far uh, away from using cash already, uh, that initially, for example, in Sweden, when you, uh, 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 when you got the sense that the central bank was really pushing 
pushing the population and also banks to bring more and more digital services to the market and move away from cash, I think they have also now realized that it's, uh, it's also a risk, especially if you, uh, uh, in Sweden, for example, even if you, ha if you have cash in many stores, it is not accepted. So there, you cannot even, even pay with it anymore. Uh, in, our, in our case, we have, uh, uh, we have realized that since it, also, it is also the central bank's duty to make sure that if there's any sort of emergency in the country, we still need to make sure that there's a system for people to pay for uh, uh, food, at least, or the, the, what, uh, things that they need. Uh, need in, 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 an in an emergency, if there's no infrastructure even anymore and the stores cannot accept cash, then you really have a problem, which is why we, uh, we really want to make sure that cash remains there even, even if it's used less and less on a daily basis, but at least I think the infrastructure should be there. People should have uh, access to cash, and I think stores should also accept cash. All right, over there. Yeah, um, hello, I'm Ember. Uh, thanks for, for being here and uh, giving us another approach, uh, like then, uh, as the one we, we had yesterday from the Bundesbank. Uh, you made it quite clear why uh, your like why Estonia entered the eurozone, but my question is about the timing uh, because like 2011 was kind of a bad time in the eurozone because the sovereign debt crisis has just struck uh, the euro area, and uh, the euro was kind of challenged and. Uh, you made it clear that uh, Estonia wanted to enter the Eurozone for uh, certainty and stability, but in that case, it wasn't like really a good time. And so, yeah, why, what, why 2011? So you're asking if we had any doubts about the timing. So I, basically the, uh, the crisis in Estonia was even bigger <laughs> before that, so if you, uh, uh, so we came through really turbulent times. Of course, we saw that there, uh, uh, there are problems in the, uh, in the Eurozone. But uh, just given the fact that, as I explained, really, uh, it just made so much economic sense, we were tied to Euro in every way or, uh, already before, I don't think anyone really had uh, serious second thoughts. Because especially since the uh, economy of Estonia, it dropped quite significantly from 2008, 2009. That was one, uh, one point where many investors had questions about uh, the Estonian economy and whether you can maintain your, uh, your uh, exchange rate. So I think if we had, at that point, had already the euro, it would already uh, uh, had, help, had helped us uh, during uh, that crisis. But it, uh, so first of all, it, uh, I don't think it raised many fundamental questions in terms of timing. It was also it was difficult because to enter the euro, you need to uh, meet the uh, Maastricht criteria. Uh, we, uh, in Estonia, we, we had the lowest government debt uh, level in Europe, so we didn't have any problems with that. But, uh, but it was such a deep crisis that I think, uh, with hindsight, it would have made sense to uh, increase government spending and try to uh, prop up the economy a little bit uh, uh, during and after the crisis. But since we were working so hard to, uh, uh, to maintain this uh, uh, budget balance, more or less, so we couldn't effectively do that. Uh, and uh, and I be perhaps that, so that was an issue looking, uh, just looking back. Uh, the government really had to cut expenses uh, for a few years, but then at the end they still made it and they, uh, uh, they, we adopted Euro in 2011 and I think, and then after that, the recovery of the economy was also quite, quite quick. So, uh, uh, so looking back, I think we still did quite well. Can I ask yeah. another question? But I mean, in in those times, um, like Greece wanted to, like it was like the question was reason if uh, Greece would have like left the eurozone. So you hadn't like any doubt that uh, Estonia would not, like I don't know, uh, would not have the same stake in that in the sense? So it would be dangerous also for Estonia to... Yeah, yeah. Well, I think the, the situation in Greece was just so, ver so much different than, uh, than in Estonia. Especially if you look at the, uh, 
public sector finances. So in our case, I think one thing that pretty much all governments have followed since, uh, uh, since the 90s is a very conservative approach to government finances. So effectively, there is almost, uh, almost no uh, government debt. Uh, the, balance, uh, the budget has always been more or less in balance. Uh, so uh, when we looked at what's happening in Greece, we saw that they, uh, they haven't had such uh, strict uh, 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 policies with their government budget in the past. The, the government debt level is very high, and of course that uh, that creates uh, uh, its own set of problems. So, so no, we did not compare ourselves to Greece. Really, of course, there were questions when uh, when all uh, countries, uh, all other countries, had to uh, do their part to uh, support uh, support Greece. Then, I guess it was special in our case because if you look at the average income, it was at that point lower in Estonia than it was in Greece. And then you have, of course, you got a lot of criticism from, uh, from people that uh, why now we have to help them who they seem to be richer than us anyway and, uh, and why don't they just get their house in the order. But uh, I think we understood that in the benefit of, uh, of the euro area and the Europe that uh, it is at the end necessary. Are you in Thanks. favor of a balanced budget? Like in Germany, this ideology of Schwarze Null, Black Zero is being questioned nowadays. Are you in favor of this? I, uh, I actually think that, I don't know how much you know about the structural balance concept, but uh, the idea is that uh, historically we have had more or less all, uh, targeted always the balanced budget in Estonia, but I think it actually does make sense uh, in good times for the government to have even a bit of a surplus, so to uh, create some uh, buffers for uh, more difficult times to follow. But when, when again the economy is in, in a decline, then I think it makes sense just in the interest of more stability than for the government also to spend a little bit more and maybe have a little bit of a minus. But I think it should be really a little bit. And I, th and, uh, I realize that uh, for politicians, it's always very difficult to, uh, to create this uh, surplus part in the good times because you always have so many good ideas where you could spend the money. Uh, they are more happy with uh, the idea that we could spend more when the uh, times are not so good. But I think in theory, at least, this, uh, this um, sort of, a, it's called a structural budget, uh, a structural balance approach that makes a lot of sense to me. So I don't think you need to always have uh, in nominal euros a balance. All right. Your turn. Hi, um, hi, Maris. My name is Mateusz. Uh, I, uh, I come from Poland, and uh, I have a question related to my uh, nation, to my to my country. Uh, as you said, Estonia uh, coming to uh, to eurozone was a success story. Um, in Poland, uh, we wanted to go to eurozone, as as every country, as every member state should do. Uh, in some time. Uh, Apart from some some other uh, member states, um, and like we already fulfilled the convergation uh, criteria, so like five or four years ago, um, right now our like uh, inflation, our uh, deficit is, is is really low. Like our finances are really healthy, um, but when we observed uh, how the eurozone behaved uh, in times of crisis, uh, and that. The Pol Poland was the only country that, during the crisis, uh, had a positive uh, economic growth. Uh, we are still doubting uh, if coming to Eurozone is a good idea for Poland. And um, what would you say to Polish politicians? Uh, in last uh, election campaign, uh, like only one party out of five or six uh, was saying that, yes, we want to uh, enter the Eurozone. Um, do you think uh, it's a good idea for Poland uh, to go to Eurozone in, say, next 10 years? Uh, and if yes, what would you say to Polish politicians? Ooh. Uh, I don't know if I should really give advice to Polish people or politicians, but I... Uh, What's your personal... <laughs> can can the Eurozone... Uh, does the Eurozone need Poland? Uh, of course, we need uh, all the European countries. But uh, I, as, I, as I told you, this, the Estonian st story where we had the uh, fixed exchange rate, the currency board, it, it, I think the decision was much, much easier. So I realized that in case of Poland, 
uh, you have a bigger countries to start with, uh, it's easier to be independent when you're bigger, uh, you have more of a domestic economy, we are very open and uh, very dependent on exports and imports. Uh, so I, real, I, I can see that this uh, decision can be, uh, can be more difficult. You have, you basically, right now you have this floating exchange rate that can be helpful at, cer at certain, uh, certain points if you manage things well otherwise. Uh, but, uh, and I also was in Warsaw recently at the Central Bank event, they, I, I realized they also, uh, I think some, some, some of the economists still see the benefits of, uh, uh, of uh, having an independent currency. But having said that, I think if you, uh, if you are oriented towards Europe, much of your trade is with, uh, with the euro area, uh, then uh, at the end, also for example the financial sector, if you could, uh, if you could link it more with the, uh, with the rest of the uh, financial sector or the banking industry with Europe, having also the same currency, I think there are also uh, clear benefits. So uh, it's an equation you have to solve at the end, but I, uh, I would still recommend it based on Estonian, <laughs> Estonian experience now of eight years or so. So you, you would welcome Poland I with would... open arms in the Eurozone? Uh, well, the there, are certain, there are certain steps that uh, procedurally have to be uh, have to be followed. But I, uh, I think at the end, of course, Poland is welcome if uh, if Poland wants to join the euro and meets all the criteria. You have a follow up? Uh, yeah, um, I was on a conf uh, like I was on a um, conference yesterday uh, about the future of eurozone, and they were saying that okay. From this 20 years of Eurozone, only the ten, uh, first 10 were uh, actually successful and the next 10 were like, pretty problematic because of uh, yeah, differences in, uh, in member states, like Eurozone states' economies. And uh, they were saying that uh, probably this economical argument uh, was then uh, like in like beginning of the Eurozone. Uh, okay, and uh, I mean it was uh, it was really uh, good to think about this uh, trade benefits, but then uh, they said after 20 years, uh, eurozone is more of political, um, yeah, project, not so economical. So is it still uh, economic? Would it still be economically beneficial for Poland? to come to Eurozone? And is it just for being closer to the European Union? Well, I think, I think you're making a fair point, of course, that in the last 10 years there have been a lot of problems in Europe and with the, uh, with the Euro area also the way it works. Uh, a lot has also been done to, uh, to improve it. So when you look at the financial sector and also the, from the central bank's perspective, all the problems we had with the banks, I think uh, there's much uh, lesser of a risk for, um, for that repeating. We have now the bank supervision is, is handled jointly at the, at the European level. We have rules for how if a bank gets in trouble, what should, what should happen next. But uh, to be fair, I don't think all problems have really been solved. So you have uh, when it comes to, uh, for example, uh, the rules that governments should follow with with their own budgets and sort of fiscal fiscal policies, we uh, we still have uh, problems there. That uh, uh, not not everyone is first of all following the rules, and there are also questions if the rules are the best. And of course, it's up to uh, up to politicians to uh, decide on that. But uh, I'm optimistic, <laughs> so uh, uh, I take your point that of course there are there are issues with uh, with how the uh, how the euro area. Uh, economies manage sort of politically, but, um, but at the end, it's, to me, it's both a political but also an economic project. And I think you can find, in, from both categories, you can find arguments in favor of joining. Are you, are you in favor of the Maastricht, Maastricht rules? I mean, these are artificial rules. Uh, we could change them any time. Are you in favor of it? Like the 2% inflation target, 60% of total debt in your country. Well, I'm in favor of uh, having some uh, reasonable limits on, on how much governments can spend and also how much debt uh, 
uh, that governments can take on board. So, uh, of course, you can argue if maybe, in addition to these big Maastricht rules, you have more specific rules that ministers of finance have agreed upon. If uh, it maybe something needs adjusting there, but uh, but generally speaking, the short answer is yes. I think, uh, for example, a three percent uh, deficit limit on uh, government budgets is quite reasonable. I don't think you need to probably go further than that. All right. Over there, this next uh, question. Hello, I'm also from Poland, so I also can you always, Can you hold it yeah, closer yeah. to your mouth? Yeah, uh, I'm from Poland and I was also always interested closer, please. how it's uh, hard to implement the euro in the country. So what was the biggest problem that Estonia needed to cope with uh, on the way to implement the euro? I mean, from the uh, domestic economy, from the domestic uh, uh, problems, what was the biggest problem? Well, first of all, I have to admit I wasn't not in Estonia in those years. Oh, yeah. But then uh, I, I was living in the U.S. for uh, eight years. But, but then, uh, uh, of course, there were many, many practical, uh, practical problems. You have to uh, just have a smooth, what is called a changeover one, from one, uh, uh, one currency to another and make sure that uh, everyone is able to exchange their, exchange their money uh, smoothly. We could learn from the experience of other countries, so that went well. Uh, there was, I think, uh, when, you, when you think of what, peop what people were concerned about before we adopted Euro, then, uh, then there were questions whether, whether this could bring, ab bring about the price increase. Uh, so perhaps uh, uh, companies, uh, stores, they would just round up their prices to uh, 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 to I don't know, the next uh, round number, and at the end you would need to pay, you would have to pay more for uh, uh, for your goods and services. So we at the central bank, after we had adopted euro, we had a study on that and uh, and found that this really was not a meaningful uh, meaningful impact. I think 0.2 percent of uh, of an impact on prices came uh, fr uh, from the euro adoption. So uh, so that was a worry, but it didn't really turn out to be a a big issue. And other than that, I think everyone, everything actually went quite smoothly. Oh, that's great. You have a follow-up? Yeah, thank you, thank you. Yeah. Okay. Over there is the next one. Hello. What's your name? Hey. And please uh, speak very closely into yeah, the yeah. mic. My name is Yanis. We are from Greece. And uh, before the question, uh, of course, we would like to stay in the Eurozone, to stay in Europe. Uh, and uh, I think that uh, we, do, we made many steps for this direction to avoid the financial crisis or the bankruptcy. So, the question. Uh, we know that Estonia is uh, a digital miracle. So, uh, how, to, how could Greece uh, fight bureaucracy in order to transform digitally, like Estonia? Uh, thank you for the question. First of all, I know you have done a lot in Greece to uh, to be more resilient in the future. Yeah, yeah. Uh, just uh, well, just to come back to the previous question, I think if you ask about how people feel about the euro and the uh, and if it has benefited the countries, uh, you have, I guess, roughly three fourths of uh, uh, of uh, people in the in the euro area countries saying that they actually feel that it's good for them and good for the economy. So. The politicians in uh, in countries that don't have the euro have a different message to their people, and that reflects also in the uh, uh, is reflected in the in the outcome of the polls. But I think generally, people in in the euro area are happy with the euro. But now coming to the question about uh, uh, about the Estonian uh, digital miracle, I don't know. If maybe I'm a modest person. I don't know if it's a miracle, but it's true that uh, in Estonia we have been uh, successful in particular in the public sector, to have all the uh, uh, public services digitally accessible. It's, the idea is that it should be very, very easy for every citizen to get whatever service they need from the government uh, as, in as efficient manner as possible. Uh, I think a, bit, a, a very important decision on the, on the way to that was in around 99 or 2000, when everyone was given a uh, digital ID card. Uh, at first, you didn't have uh, many uses to it. You can also use it as a travel document, but there's a digital chip and you have your own PIN codes. Uh, and now, they, and then the government started uh, building up more and more services that you can use with this digital identity that nowadays you also have it on a mobile phone, so you, you don't even need a phone. 
uh, so it's imp first of all, it's important that all the uh, you, you're able to build up an infrastructure where all services can link up to. So we have this one big uh, so basic infrastructure that is called X Road for Estonia, and then you have different uh, different offices with their services that can link up to it. So for, for example, I can log on to a government uh, a portal. Uh, with my secure ID and I can see, first of all, all information that the government has on me, starting with my family members or the real estate, the cars that I own, if I have my health insurance, everything in order. Uh, I can file my taxes over the internet very quickly. It is also, um, it is pre-filled. So uh, the tax office, because it gets from the, from the company where I work, or in my case, the central bank, it already knows how much uh, I have been, how much taxes have been paid on my income, uh, it can, from that, they really know how much of uh, income I earn. Uh, and if you, if you just open this pre-filled tax report and everything looks right, you just click OK and you have, you have filed your tax return for the year. So, uh, I think there's just, there has been a, uh, an idea that everything should be made as digital, as simple as possible. Uh, there is also the concept that the, I think is important and other countries might uh, uh, try to implement is that uh, the government should not ask the same piece of information from anyone what they have asked already. So if I, if I have given my address, for example, or the name of my kids, well, they're actually here today, so I'm, it's, the it's the first time they uh, hear father work. <laughs> Uh, so if, if, if the government already has asked for my address, for example, for a registry, then the idea is that they, uh, they shouldn't ask again because the government has it already. Uh, and you can, if you have that concept and you try to use it in, at every service or at every step, then at the end it makes just everything so much easier. Do you have a follow-up? Yeah, yeah. Okay. I do. Okay. You're from Greece as well? Yeah. All right. Go ahead. Um, given the fact that ACB restarted QE, uh, and in 12 months they say that there will be no German yields to buy, um, I mean, how prepared is ECB for the next crisis that it's kind of already coming? And um, do you think that Eurozone can keep on moving, having uh, like common monetary policy but no fiscal policy? With no common fiscal policy, because we see like other countries have big sur surpluses and other have big deficits. Mm. Were these were these questions given to you by the Bloomberg or Reuters journalists or? <laughs> no. Sorry. No, just kidding. This is just the kind of question that the Bloomberg colleagues would ask. <laughs> oh, <they asked laughs> but then, um, of course, the uh, uh, you can you can imagine. I'm just now. You're asking if the first question was with the uh, central bank is out of options to do anything, basically. So sure. I, uh, the short answer is no. I think you can imagine. We're, right now we're doing unconventional things. You could, of course, imagine even more unconventional things if things, if the situation gets really bad and you could start buying different like what? kinds of assets. Like what? Uh, I don't want to get into specifics. <laughs> <laughs> Give us but one I, example. No, I don't want to give exam examples. Well, you, you see, if you look at different, it's not that I recommend it at all, but if you look at uh, different central banks in, say, in Japan or in, uh, in Switzerland, they are, they are buying more different kinds of assets than we, uh, we do at the ECB. So I think there, there are ways to go beyond the government bonds that uh, and the and the little bit of corporates and others that other assets that we have been buying now. Sorry, sorry. Your second question was about uh, if you think that we can keep on moving on, if Eurozone can keep on moving on, ah, okay, the fiscal. common fiscal policy. Yeah. Well, I, I can see it would be uh, very helpful to have more of a meaningful uh, also uh, sort of a fi also a budget for the euro area. Of course, you should coordinate. Fiscal policy. We have. We were talking about before the fiscal rules that that governments really, I think, should follow, even if it's not the, not the euro area or a European budget. Uh, now, the uh, it would be helpful also if there were a more meaning, 
if there was a more meaningful budget for the euro area that you could use to stabilize uh, the economy when needed. I know that the minister, ministers of finance, they have agreed on something now, something but, small, uh, yeah. but it's, just, uh, it's just very small. So I, so I think it's a good idea in principle and we should move in that direction. I talked a lot of, to a lot of people uh, here the last two days. Um, there are a lot of fans of the euro bonds. Are you friends of euro bonds? Like so we collective we issue collective uh, bonds with uh, yes. while sharing the risks. So Germans share the risk of the Greeks and the Estonians, yeah. and Estonians share the risk with the Germans. That would be fair, right? We are Europeans. You think we have a, the same currency, um, right? Uh, well, I think we. Uh, uh, I think in, it would make sense at some point perhaps to get there, but I see the uh, political difficulties, of course, that, uh, that we have, we have agreed, up, agreed on those uh, rules when it comes to budgets. These are very, these are very difficult to follow for, uh, uh, for governments, but then uh, you also you get a sense that the level of risk in different, different countries, different economies is very different. For example, given the very, uh, very high government debt levels in one country compared to another, uh, I can see it, it is difficult to just agree now that we will just uh, issue joint, joint bonds that we all share equally because the risk that one country is taking with it is so much higher than what the other country is taking. Uh, I, I understand that it would be helpful in the long term, but uh, I'm not sure if we could imagine it happen in, in a very short term. But what would need to happen for you to be in favor of euro bonds? Well, I am in favor in principle, but then uh, I just don't see it as being very realistic in the near term. So I think we should be... Well, well, let's, we let's, should be we're, we're young people. Let's, yeah, these are young people. Let's, talk, let's think long term. Out of the box. Yes. <laughs> what would I need think, to happen for euro bonds? I think, the, uh, I think we, and also the politicians, we should feel comfortable that uh, more or less the, so the level of risk is comparable in, uh, uh, when it comes to bonds issued by different governments, and then you could also do it jointly. And right now, I don't think the feeling is quite there. And this is, this is also something that is holding back, for example, when speaking of banking, uh, then there is, this, uh, there is this idea of a banking union that I think we have uh, to a large extent, we have been able to build, we now have this joint supervision of banks, we have these uh, rules for banks that run into troubles, but we don't have joint deposit insurance. And this is, it's actually exactly the same problem, that, uh, that uh, there's a feeling that given the different levels of risk in different countries, there are some banks, banking systems that are much more riskier than others, and then, uh, then you don't want to just so start sharing uh, sharing all the risks immediately, even if I also agree that actually it makes sense. If we have, uh, if we want to have a single, really a single market, also a single market for banking, that you really should have this safety net also uh, managed jointly. All right. I think, wh where's the next one? There. Hello, I'm Jonas. Uh, I have a question concerning the decisions from the EZB. So you're sitting there together, for example, with all the other presidents of the central banks, for example, Jens Weidmann, we had here yesterday. Um, for example, he's like president of the Bundesbank, like from Germany, big country, like a big bank. For the decisions, like does his view or his opinion count the same as maybe yours or other small countries? Or maybe he has a bigger influence on the decisions of the EZB because he's from a more a, like economical, more powerful or bigger country than other small countries? Well, the way that the uh, decisions are taken at the ECB uh, Governing Council when it comes to monetary policy and all the policy decisions, then every uh, council member has one vote. So there are 19 presidents of central banks and then there are the uh, board members of the ECB. They are also voting. So uh, in that sense, every, uh, every country has one uh, or every, it's pretty, I, if I'm there, I'm not representing my country, but we should all be taking the European view, basically. I'm not there trying to do uh, what's good for Estonia, but what's good for, uh, for the Euro area. Uh, so the, the answer to your question is that every, every member of the Council has, has one vote. Of course, I realize that as I come from a, from a much smaller country, 
in a way, it's a huge responsibility because you, even if the economy or the, your your financial system is so much so much smaller than uh, when it really gets to voting a voting situation, then uh, then you have just as strong as a vote than uh, than central bank presidents from different countries have. So uh, I think it's just a huge responsibility, but uh, I think it makes makes sense since people, since the members of the council they are not representing their their country interests, but uh, it, they are just sent there one person from each country to do what's good for Europe. You have a follow up? No, it's fine. Like uh, Jens Jens Weidmann is appointed by the German government. Who are you appointed by? Like who who decides you're going to be so the boss? This, uh, this is different in different countries. So in our case, uh, we have a supervisory council uh, of the central bank. You have their. Uh, there's a, the chairman is an ex-prime minister, so you have half of the council members are politicians, and then you have some uh, experts and from academia. So we have eight council members. They, have, they uh, uh, make the selection for the president, and then the president of the country has to sign off or confirm. So in my case, the government or the parliament is not directly involved. But in some other countries, it's the parliament who appoints the... Uh, uh, president of the Central Bank, so that can differ. All right. I think the next one, yeah. her? Yes, so uh, I would like to come back to um, the question that was asked earlier about the digital economy or uh, transformation, if you will. So uh, this, of course, also comes with risks, and the one I would think about most would be cyber. So I was wondering what Estonia is doing um, on that and maybe even together with the ECB because uh, you mentioned TransferWise which I understand is a financial company and of course the digital transformation creates more like interconnectedness so the, the problem or risk becomes even greater. Yes, I, uh, I agree there are risks. Uh, I, we're, we're taking it very serious in Estonia also. A lot of effort has been put into making this uh, system as safe as possible. I don't think there have been any cases for, uh, uh, for it where it has failed. So when it comes to these digital IDs and the way you, you can log on to different systems, you have, first of all, you need to have this actual, uh, uh, actual uh, chip or this physical piece of uh, uh, or cert certificate. And then you have, further you have, uh, you need to know your passcode plus for two secure codes. So I think there's several layers of security that, uh, that help make it safe. Uh, I, over time, I, think, I know it has, has, there were some concerns at some point that the security level was even, uh, even increased. So basically, uh, we, uh, I think the approach has been, for example, we, we use it also for voting. So you can, in the elections, you can vote from your computer very quickly and you don't have to go to a polling station. So some politicians were worried with whether it's safe enough. But then, uh, then really, I think if you, if you use exactly the same technology to log on to your internet bank, I think, I guess many of you, or most of you here use internet banking yourself, then uh, it will, of course, banks have taken care of that it really is very secure the way that you handle your money. So effectively, we were just, uh, using the same level and the same kind of security also for other and also for public sector services. And so far it hasn't failed. I think we have had cases where, where paper documents with sensitive in information have been found in the trash and, uh, and people get access to data that they shouldn't have. So this, in a way, it's safer if it's, if it's behind the digital lock that it's, uh, that it's difficult to break. So. Uh, so I don't. I I, I realize there are risks with uh, cybersecurity, but uh, without really being a technology person, I think it's possible to manage those. And there are risks also by not being digital and modern. Um, yes, I understand. But then, um, when you hear the debate about cyber risk, they don't really say whether it will happen, but when it will happen. So um, I don't know. I f I feel like still there's work to do and uh, especially with finance and us all using like apps, um, I think we need to make it a bit even safer. 
I agree. We, mm. keep, we need to keep working on it also. Well, at the central bank, really, the, uh, we, we've, we've been thinking, what are the next, next few years, the five more important things that we want to accomplish, actually? Uh, one of them is, is working on uh, cyber risks and making sure that we are resilient in any, in any situation. So I, uh, so I agree, we need to keep working on it and it is a very important issue, but I, I don't really see any major problems that we're having in Estonia right now in that regard. Uh, are people like the, the other side of the medal when it comes to cyber security is surveillance? Are people in Estonia afraid of their government knowing what they buy and uh, where they go to? Because, I mean, when you do it digitally, it becomes transparent or it could be transparent what you do. And that's the, one of the reasons why people favor cash because you can, it can be more private. Yes. I think uh, I, mean, it's I like, understand it's there are a, cultural differences in different. It's like the wet dream of a yes. surveillance state, like having yes. no but cash. And I, I, first of all, I realize there are in different countries people have different views about the uh, uh, the data protection. Of course, also in Estonia, we, as every other country in the European Union, we have very uh, very uh, strong rules. Now, just recently, there was new European regulation on uh, on uh, data protection and how you shouldn't. How you should be really careful with uh, with personal data of people. Actually, when you when you say that the government knows what I buy or what I do, then uh, this is really no different in Estonia than it is in here. So the government doesn't follow my uh, my bank card transactions. It's the bank that, in my case and in your case, knows what you're buying or where you're buying at least. I think at the end, Google probably knows more about me still than the Estonian government. So. Uh, and the same applies to you. <laughs> uh, and I think peop I, I don't think really that there's any more surveillance of people uh, uh, in Estonia by the government. It's just that the services have been made more efficient. We don't have any of the uh, uh, facial recognition cameras on the street like you have in China where the government knows where you're walking. We have it here too, Berlin? Uh, we don't. Oh. Over there. Hello, I'm Johan. Um, my question is about the interest rates. Um, Sorry, about what again? The interest rates. Um, how fast do you think um, the central bank is able to pull the interest rates up in the, um, if, if they want to? Well, I, uh, I cannot really say anything different from what, what is the best knowledge uh, for the time being and what has been uh, said also uh, officially by, <laughs> by the ECB that we, uh, when we look at the uh, next few years outlook, then the inflation still appears to remain quite low. So when I, was me where I mentioned we have this forward guidance instrument as something we can uh, also employ when uh, doing monetary policy. So effectively the, the guidance right now is that until the inflation uh, gets, gets closer to the target, then the interest rates will remain as low as they are. So I don't really have any better forecast for the inflation than the ECB does. So that's, uh, that's what I have to say. You follow up? Um, in which time frame do you think this, this will happen? Um, like the next 10 to 20 years? Oh, I certainly hope that in the next uh, 10 or 20 years. <laughs> well, the, the forecasts are only for the next, uh, next few years. And I, th and I think for the next few years, the. Uh, uh, the interest rates will remain low. Of course, I hope that the economy of, uh, of uh, Europe and Euro area will uh, grow fast enough and the prices will also pick up and then we, we can go back to a more normal, uh, normal situation because uh, it, there hasn't been much experience with the, with the negative interest, in the interest rates in the past and especially if they, if they stay as low as, a, uh, for, as they are for a very long period, I think you you may start having some issues. Are you in favor of growth itself? Like, is it a mantra of yours? Like, we need growth, growth, growth? Because, I mean, when it comes to the climate uh, growth, uh, economic growth means more CO2 emissions. Like, do you think it's possible that we can be independent of economic growth in the future? I think it's actually it's still a separate question whether it needs to mean more CO2 emissions. It has. Well, it right, has. Now, right now, the last 100 years always yes, meant uh, yes. more CO2 emissions. But there has never been so much 
focus on climate issues and finding new te technologies that are more efficient uh, uh, in the past. So I think, uh, first of all, I, I know this has been the case that more growth has created more problems for the environment. I don't think it necessarily has to be that forever. But now from, the, from my perspective, if I we, like growth... We, we need to stop it. Some yes. Hearts, one, one way or the other. Yes. Now that's a separate topic. But when coming back to, I agree. <laughs> but then coming back to, uh, uh, coming back to growth, then uh, I think you need some growth at least. Well, no, from from narrowly from the central bank's perspective, you want to have a, you have at least also a low but positive inflation because otherwise, if the prices start falling, then you get the, the different kinds of economic problems. If you have prices going up, you, you also want to, the economy to go up, and it's, so I think you need a reasonable level of growth, and that would be good for us. But, uh, but I agree, we should find a way to also not do harm to the economy. All right. I think over there. Uh, hi, I'm Andres, and I wanted to ask you your opinion on the project of the capital markets uh, union, and what is the view of the ECB on that project? Is it something that has to be incentivized or are there any any risks that might that might um, arise from from this project and how is going to be the dynamic if, if of the ECB and the financing of uh, the banks after this project takes place is it going to be um, the bank uh, the role of the ECB is going to be maybe easier or or not hmm? Closer. On the, yeah. On the Capital Markets Union, I think it's a very good and necessary project, of course. Um, well, right now, we have in Europe, the, uh, the financial market is very much focused on banking. Uh, it is so, in most European countries, especially in smaller countries like in Estonia, we have a very, very small sm uh, stock market. There are almost, uh, uh, almost no bonds. Traded. The government has no bonds. Uh, there is difficult for companies to issue issue bonds. So if we had more of a capital market, and if it would be more of a common market for uh, for Europe, it would offer benefits to uh, to companies that need funding. It would be good for the economy. For investors, it would be easier to uh, uh, to invest. So I think uh, so. Of course, overall, it's a very uh, very uh, uh, positive. Uh, initiative, of course, there are also problems that now uh, uh, politicians that have to make sure that the laws allow for all that have uh, have run into. So there are issues like bankruptcy laws, for example, are different in different countries. And then the ministers of justice they feel very strongly about their approach being the right one in uh, in a particular country, and it's difficult to agree on exactly the same rules uh, that would. Uh, that would apply for uh, for the capital markets as a whole, but uh, I think we should we should keep making an effort to uh, to uh, get there at some point. I think it's still more of an more of an issue of legislation and of uh, politicians, not so much for uh, for central banks that we can really do to make it happen. Uh, I think I, I think it just would benefit. Benefit, uh, benefit us all. Perhaps it would make it easier also for uh, for the central bank to uh, to do monetary policy because right now we're just so reliant on banks. But then you uh, then you would have uh, sort of more options. But uh, so th I think this is this is where I would conclude. I, I don't I don't see that we could really do much as the ECB or central banks in general. But I'm very much in favour of the capital markets union. You have a follow up. Uh, just maybe, maybe just to, to please have it close to your mouth, everybody. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. Because yeah, the rest can understand you then. Maybe to have an idea, how big is is this project uh, going to be, or, or is it um, um, is it um, going to help a lot the, the ECB uh, because of these uh, less dependency on bank loans, or or maybe you see that th there's still going to be. A, a big dependency on, on banking financing. I think it's difficult to quantify the impact as we as we really don't know how uh, how how big or how big of a change it could at the end be. So uh, to answer this question, I really don't really don't have a don't have a good uh, uh, good specific answer. You previously you asked about risks. 
And actually, one thing uh, just to mention when we were looking at it from Estonia, which is a very small country, you, uh, I know some, some, uh, uh, some people in the financial sector are also concerned that if, you, if it's all a joint market, perhaps it will be very concentrated in some bigger financial centers. So perhaps all the capital markets activity will be handled from Frankfurt and whatever little we have in Tallinn right now, even that would disappear. So I'm not sure if we should be worried about that. I think, I think there are, first of all, there would be opportunities for company to, companies to get access to uh, more diverse and different sources of funding. So on balance, it should, should be positive and there should be room for different, different pockets of activity in different countries. All right, hey. over there. Hey, I'm Jonathan, and my question has to do with unconventional monetary policy. Um, you were talking earlier about the interest rate problem, and what struck my mind was the paper of Jordi Galli uh, on the ir irrelevance of the zero lower bound, and I just wanted to know if you're aware of this, and what is your approach to the problem, and if, if it's actually relevant or irrelevant, the zero lower bound. Uh, I think, well, zero lower bound, it meant uh, historically, it meant that you can drop, you can uh, go interest rates, uh, you can lower interest rates up until zero. So now in the last years, we have learned that you can actually go lower. <laughs> so now, uh, now we're not talking about zero lower bound so much as an effective lower bound. Uh, so I don't think there's a zero lower bound anymore, but I do understand and I agree that you cannot really have a very deeply negative uh, uh, policy rates from the central bank and at some point there is a limit and it, it may actually have uh, an adverse effect if you go uh, uh, go too negative. Okay, uh, I mentioned Jordi Galli on purpose because in my studies I, I have gotten the impression that he is more or less like the only one that is like uh, asked when it comes to monetary policy and I, I wanted to ask you if, that's, if my impression is correct or if there's other um, economists that you can mention that you also listen to. Oh, there are many, many economists to listen to. I, to be honest, I really don't consider myself to be a real economist, even I have studied more finance and less sort of macroeconomics. But, uh, but if you want to have, if, uh, along those lines, if you, uh, if you want to uh, read some, uh, some newer research, uh, I suggest you look into what is called the reversal rate. So that you first had a lower, uh, zero lower bound. Now you're talking about an effective lower bound that is uh, that is less than zero. And uh, and to me, it it will really, it ties also into another concept that is called a reversal interest rate, which means that if you if you have a negative interest rate, then uh, at some point the uh, the effect of it will reverse because if you if you have a deeply, deep, basically you will not have an accommodative monetary policy anymore if you go beyond a certain point, because then, uh, uh, well, it basically doesn't doesn't provide further stimulus. You could uh, mm -hmm. people at some point, if the if the money gets cheaper and cheaper, they instead of spending more, they might realize that I need to s save even more to uh, uh, to meet whatever targets, for example, for retirement I may have. And you have other um, other similar effects. So, so there are new. Uh, there's been new research now uh, that has been done given given all these unconventional things that the central banks are doing. You're not an economist, but you probably uh, read a lot about the economy. Uh, I asked it is Jens Weidmann yesterday. Do you th do you think the young people should read uh, Hayek or Karl Marx? I would recommend Hayek. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> My preference would be Hayek. Mm -hmm. but speaking of, uh, speaking of uh, these uh, old economists and books, I think uh, there's a good story about Estonia. I mentioned uh, we have been very conservative with uh, our, since early 90s with the government finances. Another part of the uh, sort of economic package that was introduced after Estonia got out of the Soviet Union in 91 was uh, basically we radically opened up everything. We had no uh, uh, tariffs, for example. Uh, there's very, basically very little uh, regulation for companies to start with. And the funny story was with, uh, with a prime minister back then who was uh, a historian who was only 33 years old. He didn't really know much about economics, but he said that 
I had, later he said, I had only read this uh, one book by Milton Friedman, uh, Free to Choose. And it sounded right, so I just went ahead and did it. <laughs> uh, I think he later got an award, a Milton Friedman Award for that. And he's, this, he's now the chairman of uh, the Central Bank Supervisory Council, so he's effectively my boss. Uh, so we have been more towards the Hayek uh, line of thinking in Estonia. So a lot of neoliberalism in Estonia. Um, we have 10 minutes left. Can we do a quick round, like maybe always short answers, so we can okay, let do a lot? Maybe start there. Yeah, here. Um, Referring to one of your earlier answers when you said on the Greek crisis, there were voices in Estonia who said, why should we help them? They seem to be better off than we are. Bearing that in mind as a background, can you imagine a scenario when it might be necessary to have a debt cut for Greece as the um, uh, IMF seems to assume or would you, in the Estonian tradition, say, no, do or die? Well, looking at Greece, of course, they seem to have a high debt burden, but at the same time, so much of it is already uh, official debt uh, given to those European uh, programs that help, uh, help finance this uh, Greek government. So personally, I don't... And, and they have to make so little payments for, for many years to come. So I, I am not too worried about that, actually. Follow up. Um, nevertheless, there are voices who say that the Greek economy, as well as the situation of private households, is so strangulated that even on a long run, they will have no chance to really recover. Um, do you see any realistic scenario where it nevertheless might be necessary to say they can't come out, they will never recover without a debt cut. Well, I, I, there, are also, um, there are also scenarios according to which it's, it will work out fine. I don't really want to uh, speculate that what, if, if you could have a very bad scenario in, in different countries, what, could we, what would we have to do back then? I think it's just difficult for me to speculate right now. But are you in principle against debt cuts or not in principle? Uh, well, I, I'm now, now I'm not speaking of Greece, but, uh, but uh, of course, if someone cannot pay, pay the debts, you have to restructure sometimes. We actually, in case of Greece, have done it already. So, so um, you should never really exclude the possibility of a government or a, or a company or whoever restructuring the debts. So this is just part of the... Uh, of the way that the, this debt business works. Like, works. All right, next one. Yes, I have a question about the Estonian-Russian relationships. How hard was the Estonian economy affected by trade regulations between the EU area and Russia? And what is the general public opinion in Estonia about Russian relationships? Uh, there are really two questions. The first one, uh, if we were affected much with the recent uh, trade restrictions? And the answer is no. We have, in Estonia, we have very, in the early 90s already, the economy had to restructure very quickly and turn away from Russia. I think uh, uh, Russia maybe has 5% of Estonian exports, so it's not really that, uh, uh, that big of an issue. We export more to Germany, I think, than to Russia. But in terms of uh, if we, if the Estonians uh, are watching carefully what's happening in Russia and the, what, what are the poli how's the politics going and uh, if there are any risks for us, of course, then the answer is yes, that we just from the historical, given the history, we, uh, we are sort of careful with, uh, with Russia, but uh, we of course try to have as good relationships as possible. All right, over there. Um, there had okay. I'm sorry. I'm Johannes. Um, there had been this um, this fight uh, between the European Union and Italy um, at the beginning of the year about uh, the state deficit. Um, what is your opinion? Um, should the EU or should the ECB, um, yeah, call um, yeah sanctions on on Italy um, that they meet their um, state deficit target? Uh, as we, we were talking before about the uh, budget rules for, 
for governments, I really think it is important, and it's the interest of Euro uh, to make sure that governments do follow the, uh, the rules as that they have themselves agreed upon. Uh, I think if someone breaks the rules, there, were, there should also be measures taken to make sure that, that uh, to disincentivize them. And this is also basically that's part of the rules that if you break them, then there's, uh, you will be punished. Luckily, the centri it's, I don't really have to answer the question directly because it's up to the ministers of finance. The, the central bank will not punish Italy, but the, minist uh, the uh, uh, ministers of finance have agreed upon the rules uh, among themselves. So it has to be from the sort of political side. Okay, over there. We have five minutes left. Hi, my name is Robert. My question is regarding central banks entering the fight against the climate crisis versus insisting upon their supposed singular mandate of price stability. Especially given that A, it's an existential crisis, and B, that the central bank does indeed have a mandate to do something against uh, climate change through Article 127, which says that the ECB should do everything to support the goals of the European Union. And you're asking whether if I think we should do something. Exactly. So I think, we, I think it does at the end also relate to what the central bank is doing. It is, first of all, it's true that uh, we have our own primary goals and targets which, which relate to uh, price stability and, and financial stability as well. Uh, I think the central bank should not be the ones really doing climate policy. You have, uh, you have governments, governments for that. But it will at the end also affect us. Uh, you, uh, you will have questions when, you, when you're concerned about financial stability, whether the climate issues will affect the financial sector, and we should be concerned about that, and we should, uh, should be paying attention. You, have, uh, you may also ask, I don't really have an opinion on that, but I, I know well, there is a debate if central banks go and buy different bonds, if they should take into account the, um, uh, also the environmental impact. Uh, I think you see some, some central banks trying to do that already. The problem in Europe is that we haven't even agreed upon what we call a taxonomy or how do you really define what is clean and what is not. Mm -hmm. So that's the first thing we need to, uh, need to agree upon. And that there, really, there is a lot of work being done also at the central banks uh, in that area. Do you, do you think it should be made illegal for public money to invest in fossil? Uh, the fossil industry, any any fossil things? I'm not sure if we should make it illegal. It would, if you regulate it properly, the industry and it takes and make them pay for the pollution that they're creating, then uh, I think that's the first step. But then uh, I guess you cannot completely kill off the, uh, uh, the industries as they are. They need to get some financing from somewhere. Right. There's a question of... But if, but, but if you, if you sh uh, tell them we're going to uh, get our money out of your business because you are in the f fossil business, uh, you either change or you die. Yes. Because well, you, you, you can, it cannot go on not, uh, either way. Uh, well, that's an option. You're talking about public money more generally or central bank specifically. Right. No, I public think. money itself. Like, uh, are you in favor of this? Like, of course, the politics... Politics have to make well, the I laws. Think if you think where the where the public money should go in that regard, it should primarily support, of course, a cleaner future and new technologies. And no uh, fossil stuff. Yes, I think that's that's probably where we are going. But I, I think that this is a, a bit bit of a broader issue than what assets the central bank buys. As the central bank is just one part of the right. public sector. But. but should we tell the uh, central banks to not invest in fossil stuff? I think we should first of all agree what is, uh, what is clean enough and what is not. About fossil, I think it's... Uh, I, think it's a, I, I don't really have a clear view if you should start with the central bank or you should just have the... Uh, have, uh, you should have the climate policy and the CO2 taxes that... Uh, that have the impact, have the effect that the general public or the politicians want, uh, and then there's the next next question is about the 
financing of businesses and what the central bank should do. All right, final question. Who, who was it? Yeah. Over um, there. Hi, I'm Lucas. Um, in the seminars here, we talked also about a more unified Europe and also about um, maybe dividing and sharing also the powerful uh, positions in the EU and Eurozone institutions across all member states. Um, can you name the most powerful office or position or chair that Estonia holds in the EU or Eurozone institutions? Because I feel like those very powerful positions are always distributed among the same uh, very powerful countries like Germany and France. Now we have a new ECB uh, president that is, again, uh, someone who came out of the blue. And um, does that, in a way, frustrate you also? That's a good question. <laughs> well, are you yeah, happy I, to be small and not important? Well, I think it is important that you get representation of uh, different countries at the uh, at the European level, I, I believe they're working on it in, uh, uh, at the European Commission when it comes to uh, who they're recruiting. Um, from my personal perspective, perhaps I'm too focused on the central banking, but as I, as I said before, it seems to me that given how much, how much uh, smaller Estonia is, for example, than Germany, then we have already be, been given a huge responsibility to have the same one vote at the, at the governing council uh, at, the, at the European Central Bank. We do have some European uh, uh, agencies in Estonia also. And, and, and we have, for example, from NATO, we have the uh, NATO Cyber Security Center that is uh, located in Tallinn. So, um, so there is something, but uh, I think you, you have a fair point that maybe we could, we could fight for more. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much, Maris. I'm sorry. <laughs> Final words. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. I, it was fun for me. I was a little bit concerned. I didn't know what you would ask about. I was surprised that there are so many hardcore monetary policy and central banking questions. What, and what, did, what did you expect? I don't know, like, uh, yeah, like what, uh, I don't know, what sports do I like? <laughs> but then, uh, and I'm very happy that my both sons, they were still here and were not, they were applauding. So I, I hope you made me look good for my uh, sons. Yeah, Thank you. I think so. I think so. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.